Book Three of the Shadow and Bone Trilogy by Lee Bardugo. Rune and Rising. Chapter Five. The whole cavern shook. Little rivulets of pebbles clattered down on us. Mal was beside me in an instant. He yanked me away from the falling rock as though I had bracketed my other side. Lights out, Mal shouted. Packs off. We shoved our packs against the walls as a kind of buttress, then doused the lanterns in case the spark set off another explosion. Boom. Above us, north of us, it was hard to tell. Long seconds passed. Boom. This one was closer, louder. Rocks and soil rained down on our bent heads. He found us, moaned Sergei, his voice ragged with fear. He couldn't have, Zoya protested. Even the opera didn't know where we were headed. Mal shifted slightly. I heard the smatter of pebbles. It's a random attack, he said. Jenny's voice trembled when she whispered. The cat is bad luck. Boom, loud enough to rattle my jaw. Metaniez, said David. Marsh gas. I smelled it a second later, peaty and foul. If there were Inferni above us, a spark would follow and blow us all to bits. Someone started crying. Squallers, commanded Mal. Send it east. How could he sound so calm? I felt Zoya move, then the rush of air as she and the others drove the gas away from us. Boom. It was hard to breathe. The space seemed too small. Oh, saint, Sergei quavered. I see flame, Toya shouted. Send it east, repeated Mal, voice steady. The whoosh of squalor wind followed. Mal's body was braced next to mine. My hand snaked out, seeking his. Our fingers twined together. I heard a small sob from my other side, and I reached for Zoya's free hand, taking it in mine. Boom. This time the whole tunnel roared with the sound of falling rock. I heard people shouting in the dark. Dust filled my lungs. When the noise stopped, Mal said, No lanterns. Alina, we need light. It was a struggle, but I found a thread of sunlight and let it blossom through the tunnel. We were all covered in dust, eyes wide and frightened. I did a quick tally. Mal, Jinya, David, Zoya, Nadia, and Harsha. Oncat tucked into his shirt. Toya, shouted Mal. Nothing. Then, we're all right. Toya's voice came from behind the wall of fallen rock blocking the tunnel, but it was strong and clear. I pressed my head to my knees in relief. Where's my brother, yelled Nadia. He's here with me in Tamar, Toya replied. Sergei and Steg, I asked. I don't know. Saints. We waited for another boom for the rest of the tunnel to come down on top of us. When nothing happened, we started scrabbling toward Toya's voice as he and Tamar dug from the other side. In a matter of moments, we saw their hands, their dirty faces staring back at us. They scooted into our section of the tunnel. As soon as Adric dropped his hands, the ceiling above where he and the twins had been standing collapsed in a billow of dust and rock. He was shaking badly. You held the cave, Zoya asked. Zoya nodded. He made a bubble as soon as we heard that last boom. Huh, Zoya said to Adric. I'm impressed. At the elation that burst over his face, she groaned. Never mind. I'm downgrading that to grudging approval. Sergey, I called. Stig? Silence, the shift of gravel. Let me try something, said Zoya. She raised her hands. I heard a crackling in my ears, and the air seemed to grow damp. Sergey, she said. Her voice sounded weirdly distant. Then I heard Sergey's voice, weak and trembling but clear, as if he were speaking right beside me. Here, he panted. Zoya flexed her fingers, making adjustments, and called to Sergey again. This time, when he replied, David said, It sounds like it's coming from below us. Maybe not, Zoya replied. The acoustics can be misleading. Mal moved farther down the passage. No, he's right. The floor in their segment of the tunnel must have collapsed. It took us nearly two hours to find them and dig them out. Toya hefting soil, Mal calling directions, the squalors maintaining the sides of the tunnel with air as I maintain a dim illumination, the others forming a line to move rocks and sand. When we found Stig and Sergei, they were covered in mud and nearly comatose. Lowered our pulses, Sergei mumbled groggily. Slow respiration. Use less air. Toya and Tamar brought them back, raising their heart rates and flushing their lungs with oxygen. Didn't think you'd come, slurred a still bleary Stig. Why, cried Jinya, gently brushing the dirt from around his eyes. He wasn't sure that you'd care, said Harsha from behind me. There were mumbled protests and some guilty looks. I did think of Stig and Harsha as outsiders. And Sergei, well, Sergei had been lost for a while now. None of us had done a very good job of reaching out to them. When Sergei and Stig could walk, we headed back to the more intact part of the tunnel. One by one, the squalors released their power as we waited to see if the ceiling would hold so they could rest. 
We brushed the dust and grime off of one another's faces and clothes as best we could, then passed a flask of kvass around. Stig clung to it like a baby with a bottle. Everyone okay? Mel asked. Never better, said Jinya shakily. David raised his hand. I've been better. We all started laughing. What? he said. How did you even do that? Nadia asked Zoya. That trick with the sound. It's just a way of creating an acoustical anomaly. We used to play with it back in school so we could eavesdrop on people in other rooms. Jinya snorted. Of course you did. Could you show us how to do it? asked Audric. If I'm ever bored enough. Squallers, Mal said. Are you ready to move again? They all nodded. Their faces had the gleam that came with using Grisha power, but I knew they must already be approaching their limits. They'd been keeping tons of rock off us for half a mile, and they'd need more than a few minutes of rest to restore themselves. Then let's get the hell out of here, Mal said. I lit the way, still wary of what surprises might be waiting for us. We moved cautiously, squalors on alert, twisting through tunnels and passages until I had no sense of which way we'd gone. We were well off the map that David and Mal had created. Every sound seemed magnified. Every fall of pebbles made us pause, frozen, waiting for the worst. I tried to think of anything but the weight of the soil above us. If the earth came down and the squalor's power failed, we would be crushed and no one would ever know. Wildflowers pressed between the pages of a book and forgotten. Eventually, I became aware that my legs were working harder and realized that the grade of the floor had turned steep. I heard relief sighs, a few quiet cheers, and less than an hour later, we found ourselves crowded into some kind of basement room, looking up at the bottom of a trap door. The ground was wet here, pocked by little puddles, signs that we must be close to the river cities. By the light from my palms, I could see that the stone walls were cracked, but whether the damage was old or the result of recent explosions, I couldn't tell. How did you do it? I asked Mal. He shrugged. Same as always. There's game on the surface. I just treated it like a hunt. Toya pulled David's old watch from the pocket of his coat. I wasn't sure when he'd acquired it. If this thing is keeping time right, we're well past sunset. You have to wind it every day, said David. I know that. Well, did you? Yes. Then it's keeping time right. I wondered if I should remind David that Toya's fist was roughly the circumference of his head. Zoya sniffed. With our luck, someone will be setting up for midnight mass. Many of the entrances and exits to the tunnels were found in holy places, but not all of them. We might emerge in the apse of a church or the courtyard of a monastery, or we might poke our heads out of the floor of a brothel. And good day to you, sir. I pushed down a crazed giggle. Exhaustion and fear were making me giddy. What if someone was waiting for us up there? What if the uproar had switched sides yet again and set the darkling on our trail? I wasn't thinking straight. Ma believed the explosions had been a random attack on the tunnels, and that was the only thing that made sense. The uproar couldn't know where we'd be or when. And even if the Darkling had somehow found out that we were headed for Rivast, why bother using bombs to drive us to the surface? He could just wait for us to turn up there. Let's go, I said. I feel like I'm suffocating. Mal signaled for Toya and Tamar to flank me. Be ready, he said to them. Any sign of trouble, you get her out of here. Take the tunnels due west as far as you can. It was only after he'd started climbing the ladder that I realized we'd all hung back, waiting for him to go first. Toya and Tamar were both more experienced fighters, and Mal was the only Akazatsia among us. So why was he the one taking the brunt of the risk? I wanted to call him back, tell him to be careful, but it would just sound absurd. Careful wasn't something we did anymore. At the top of the ladder, he gestured down at me, and I released the light, pitching us into darkness. I heard a thump, the sound of hinges straining, then a soft grunt and a creak as the trap door opened. No light flooded down, no shouts, no gunfire. My heart was pounding in my chest. I followed the sounds of Mal levering himself up, his footfalls above us. Finally, I heard the scrape of a match and light bloomed through the trap door. Mal whistled twice, the all clear. One by one, we ascended the ladder. When I stuck my head through the trap door, a chill slid over my spine. The room was hexagonal, its walls carved from what looked like blue lapis, each studded with wooden panels painted with a different saint, their golden halos glinting in the lamplight. The corners were thick with milky cobwebs. Mal's lantern rested on a stone sarcophagus. We were in a crypt. Perfect, said Zoya. From a tunnel to a tomb. What's next, an outing to a slaughterhouse? Mezel, David said, pointing to one of the names carved into the wall. They were an old Grisha family. There was even one of them at the little palace before. Before everyone died, put in Jinya helpfully. Ziva Mezel, Nadia said quietly. 
She was a squalor. Can we host this salon somewhere else? Soya asked. I want to get out of here. I rubbed my arms. She had a point. The door looked like heavy iron. Toya and Mal braced their shoulders against it as we arrayed ourselves behind them, hands raised and ferny with their flints ready. I took my position in back, prepared to wield the cut, if necessary. On three, Mal said. A burble of laughter escaped me. Everyone turned. I flushed. Well, we're probably in a graveyard, and we're about to come charging out of a tomb. Jinya giggled. If anyone's out there, we're going to scare the sneeze out of him. With the barest hint of a grin, Mal said, Good point. Let's lead with, ooh. Then the grin disappeared. He nodded at Toya. Stay low. He counted down, and they shoved. The bolt shrieked, and the tomb doors flew open. We waited, but there was no sounds of alarm to greet us. Slowly, we filed out into the deserted cemetery. This close to the river, people buried their dead above ground in case of flooding. The tombs, arrayed in tidy rows like stone houses, gave the whole place the feel of an abandoned city. A wind blew through, shaking leaves free from the trees and stirring the grasses that grew up around the smaller grave sites. It was eerie, but I didn't care. The air was almost warm after the chill of the caves. We were outside at last. I tilted my head back, breathing deeply. It was a clear, moonless night, and after those long months underground, the sight of all that sky was dizzying. And so many stars, a glittering, tangled mass that seemed close enough to touch. I let their light fall over me like a balm, grateful for the air in my lungs, the night all around me. Alina, Mal said softly. I opened my eyes. Lucretia were staring. What? He took my hands and held them out in front of me, as if we were about to start a dance. You're glowing. Oh, I breathed. My skin was silver, cocooned in starlight. I hadn't even realized I was summoning. Oops. He ran a finger down my forearm where the sleep had ridden up, watching the play of light over my skin, a smile curling his lips. Abruptly, he stepped back. He dropped my hands as if they were hot. Be more careful, he said tightly. He gestured to Audric to help Toya reseal the crypt, then spoke to the group. Stay close and keep quiet. We need to find cover before dawn. The others fell into step behind him, letting him lead yet again. I hung back, actively brushing the light from my skin. It clung to me as if my body was thirsty for it. It clung to me as if my body was thirsty for it. When Zoya drew level with me, she said, You know, Starkov, I'm beginning to think you turned your hair white on purpose. I flicked a speck of starlight from my wrist, watching it fade. Yes, Zoya. Courting death is an integral part of my beauty regimen. She shrugged and cast a glance at Mal. Well, it's a little obvious for my taste, but I'd say the whole moon maiden look is working. The last person I wanted to talk to about Mal was Zoya, but that had sounded suspiciously like a compliment. I remembered her gripping my hand during the cave-in and how strong she'd stayed throughout it all. Thanks, I said, for keeping us safe down there, for helping save Sergei and Stig. Even if I hadn't meant a word of it, the look of shock on her face would have been worth it. You're welcome, she managed. Then she stuck her perfect nose in the air and added, But I won't always be around to save your ass, Sun Summoner. I grinned and followed her down the aisle of graves. At least she was predictable. It took us far too long to get out of the cemetery. The rows of crypts stretched on and on, cold testimony to the generations Ravka had been at war. The paths were raked clean, the graves marked with flowers, painted icons, gifts of candy, little piles of precious ammunition, small kindnesses even for the dead. I thought of the men and women bidding us goodbye at the White Cathedral, pressing their offerings into our hands. I was grateful when we finally cleared the gates. The terror of the cave-in and long hours on our feet had taken their toll, but Mal was determined to get us as close to Revost as he could before dawn. We trudged onward, marching parallel to the main road, keeping to the starlit fields. Occasionally we glimpsed a lone house, a lantern glowing in the window. It was a relief, somehow, to see these signs of life, to think of a farmer rising in the night to fill his cup with water, his head turning briefly to the window in the darkness beyond. The sky had just started to lighten when we heard the sounds of someone approaching on the road. We barely had time to scurry into the woods and take shelter in the brush before we glimpsed the first wagon. There were about fifteen people in the convoy, mostly men, a few women, all bristling with weapons. I glimpsed bits and pieces of First Army uniforms. Standard-issue trousers shoved into decidedly non-regulation cowhide boots, an infantry coat shorn of its brass buttons. It was impossible to tell what they were transporting. Their cargo had been covered by horse blankets and tightly secured to the wagon beds with rope. Militia, Tamar whispered. Could be, said Mal. 
Not sure where a militia would get repeating rifles. If they're smugglers, I don't know any of them. I could follow, said Toya. Why don't I just go do a waltz in the middle of the road, Tamar taunted. Toya was hardly quiet on his feet. I'm getting better, Toya said defensively. Besides, Mal silenced them with a look. Do not pursue, do not engage. As Mal led us deeper into the trees, Toya grumbled. You don't even know how to waltz. We made camp in a clearing close to the slender tributary of the Sokol, the river fed by the glaciers in the Petrozoi and the heart of commerce in the port cities. We hoped we were far enough from town and the main roads that we wouldn't have to worry about anyone stumbling upon us. According to the twins, the smugglers' meeting place was in a busy square that overlooked the river and rebossed. Tamar already had a compass and map in hand. Though she must have been as tired as the rest of us, she would have to leave immediately to make it to town before noon. I hated letting her walk into what might be a trap, but we'd agreed that she would have to be the one to go. Toya's size made him far too conspicuous, and none of the rest of us knew the way the smugglers worked or how to recognize them. Still, my nerves were jangling. I had never understood the twins' faith and what they were willing to risk for it. But when the time had come to choose between me and the operat, they'd shown their loyalty in no uncertain terms. I gave Tamar's hand a quick squeeze. Don't do anything reckless. Nadia had been hovering your rye. Now she cleared her throat and kissed Tamar once on each cheek. Be safe, she said. Tamar flashed her heart renders grin. If anyone wants trouble, she said, flicking back her coat to reveal the handles of her axes, I have a fresh supply. I glanced at Nadia. I had the distinct impression Tamar was showing off. She pulled up her hood and set out at a jog through the trees. You yosesh, Toya called after her in shoe. Me wasesh, she shouted over her shoulder. And then she was gone. What does that mean? It's something our father taught us, Toya replied. You yosesh, despise your heart. But that's the direct translation. The real meaning is more like, do what needs to be done. Be cruel if you have to. What's the other part? Ni wasesh, I have no heart. Mal raised a brow. Your dad sounds like fun. Toya smiled the slightly mad grin that made him look just like his sister. He was. I looked back the way Tamar had gone. Somewhere beyond the trees and the fields beyond that lay Rivost. I sent my own prayers with her. Bring back news of a prince, Tamar. I don't think I can do this alone. We laid out bedrolls and divvied up food. Audric and Nadia started raising a tent while Toya and Mal scouted the perimeter, setting up stands where guards would be posted. I saw Stig trying to get Sergei to eat. I hoped that being above ground might bring him around, but though Sergei seemed less panicked, I could still feel tension coming off him in waves. In truth, we were all jumpy. As lovely as it was to lie beneath the trees and see the sky again, it was also overwhelming. Life in the White Cathedral had been miserable, but manageable. Up here, things felt wilder, beyond my control. Militias and the Darkling's men roamed these lands. Whether we found Nikolai or not, we were back in this war, and that meant more battles, more lives lost. The world seemed suddenly large again. I wasn't sure I liked it. I looked at our camp. Harsha already curled up and snoozing with Onkai on his chest, Sergei pale and watchful, David back propped against a tree, a book in his hands as Jinya fell asleep with her head in his lap, Nadia and Audric struggling with poles and canvas while Zoya looked on and didn't bother to help. Despise your heart. I wanted to. I didn't want to grieve anymore, to feel loss or guilt or worry. I wanted to be hard, calculating. I wanted to be fearless. Underground, that had seemed possible. Here, in this wood, with these people, I was less sure. Eventually, I must have dozed, because when I woke, it was late afternoon and the sun was slanting through the trees. Toya was beside me. Tamar's back, he said. I sat upright, fully awake, but the look on Toya's face was grim. No one approached her? He shook his head. I straightened my shoulders. I didn't want anyone to see my disappointment. I should be grateful Tamar had made it in and out of the city safely. Does Mal know? No, said Toya. He's filling canteens at the creek. Harsha and Stig are on watch. Should I get them? It can wait. Tamar was leaning against a tree, gulping down water from a tin cup as the others gathered around her to hear her report. Any trouble, I asked. She shook her head. And you're sure you were in the right place, Toya said. West side of the market square. I got there early, stayed late, checked in with a shopkeeper, watched the same damn puppet show four times. If the post is active, someone should have spoken to me. We could try again tomorrow, suggested Audric. I should go, said Toya. You were there a long time. If you show up again, people may notice. Tamar wiped her mouth with the back of her hand. If I stab the puppeteer, will that draw too much attention? Not if you're quiet about it, replied Nadia. Her cheeks pinked as we all turned to look at her. I'd never heard Nadia crack a joke. She'd mostly been an audience to Marie. 
Tamar slipped a dagger from her wrist and twirled it, balancing his point on one fingertip. I can be quiet, she said, and merciful. I may let the puppets live. She took another gulp of water. I heard some news, too. Big news. West Ravka has declared for Nikolai. That got our attention. They're blocking off the western shore of the fold, she continued. So if the Darkling wants weapons or ammunition, he'll have to go through Fierda, finished Zoya. But it was bigger than that. This meant the Darkling had lost West Ravka's coastline, its navy, the already tenuous access Ravka had to trade. West Ravka now, Toya said. Maybe the Shuhan next. Or Kirch, put in Zoya. Or both, crowed Audric. I could almost see the tendril of hope twisting its way through our ranks. So now what, Sergei asked, tugging anxiously at his sleeve. Let's wait one more day, Nadia said. I don't know, said Tamar. I don't mind going back, but there were Oprichniki in the square today. Not a good sign. The Oprichniki were the Darkling's personal soldiers. If they were prowling the area, we had good reason to move on as soon as possible. I'm going to go talk to Mal, I said. Don't get too comfortable. We may need to be ready to leave in the morning. The others dispersed while Tamar and Nadia walked off to dig through the rations. Tamar kept bouncing and spinning her knife, definitely showing off, but Nadia didn't seem to mind. I picked my way toward the sound of the water, trying to sort through my thoughts. If West Ravka had declared for Nikolai, that was a good sign that he was alive and well and making more trouble for the Darkling than anyone in the White Cathedral had realized. I was relieved, but I wasn't certain what our next move should be. When I reached the creek, Mal was crouching in the shallows, barefoot and bare-chested, his trousers rolled up to his knees. He was watching the water, his expression focused, but at the sound of my approach, he shot to his feet, already lunging for his rifle. Just me, I said, stepping out of the woods. He relaxed and dropped back down, eyes returning to the creek. What are you doing out here? For a moment, I just watched him. He stayed perfectly still, then suddenly, his hands plunged into the stream and emerged with a wriggling fish. He tossed it back. No point holding on to it when we couldn't risk making a fire to cook it. I'd seen him catch fish this way at Karamzin even in winter when Trivka's pond froze over. He knew just where to break the ice, just where to drop his line or the moment to make his grab. I'd waited on the banks, keeping him company, trying to spot places in the trees where the birds made their nests. It was different now, the water reflecting spangles of light over the planes of his face, the smooth play of muscle beneath his skin. I realized I was staring and gave myself a little shake. I'd seen him without a shirt before. There was no reason to be an idiot about it. Tamar's back, I said. He stood, all interest in the fish lost. And? No sign of Nikolai's men. Mal sighed and scrubbed a hand through his hair. Damn it. We could wait another day, I offered, though I already knew what he would say. We've wasted enough time. I don't know how long it will take us to get south or to find the Firebird. All we need is to get stuck in the mountains when the snow comes. And we have to find a safe house for the others. Tamar says West Ravka has declared for Nikolai. What if we took them there? He considered. That's a long journey, Alina. We'd lose a lot of time. I know, but it's safer than anywhere this side of the fold, and it's another chance to find Nikolai. Might be less dangerous trekking south on that side, too. He nodded. All right. We need to get the others ready. I want to leave tonight. Tonight? No point waiting around. He waded out of the water, bare toes curling on the rocks. He didn't actually say dismissed, but he might as well have. What else was there to talk about? I started toward camp, then remembered I hadn't told him about the opera Nikki. I stomped back to the creek. Mal, I began, but the words died on my lips. He had been to pick up the canteens. His back was to me. What is that? I said angrily. He whirled, twisting himself around, but it was too late. He opened his mouth. Before he could get a word out, I snapped. If you say nothing, I will knock you senseless. His mouth clamped shut. Turn around, I ordered. For a moment, he just stood there. Then he sighed and turned. A tattoo stretched across his broad back. Something like a compass rose, but much more like a sun the points reaching from shoulder to shoulder and down his spine. Why, I asked. Why would you do this? He shrugged and his muscles flexed beneath the intricate design. Mal, why would you mark yourself this way? I have a lot of scars, he said finally. This one I chose. I looked closer. There were letters worked into the design. Iya sta rescu. I frowned. It looked like ancient Ravkin. What does this mean? He said nothing. Mal, it's embarrassing and sure enough, I could see a flush spreading over his neck. Tell me. He hesitated, then cleared his throat and muttered, I am become a blade. I am become a blade. Was that what he was? This boy whom the Grisha had followed without argument? Whose voice stayed steady when the earth caved in around us? Who'd told me I would be a queen? I wasn't sure I recognized him anymore. I brushed my fingertips over the letters. He tensed. His skin was still damp from the river. Could be worse, I said. 
I mean, if it said, let's cuddle or I am become ginger pudding, that would be embarrassing. He released a surprised bark of laughter, then hissed in a breath as I let my fingertips trail the length of his spine. His fists clenched at his sides. I knew I should step away, but I didn't want to. Who did it? Toya, he rasped. Did it hurt? Less than it should have. I reached the farthest point of the sunburst, right at the base of his spine. I paused, then dragged my fingers back up. He snapped around, capturing my hand in a hard grip. Don't, he said fiercely. I... I can't do this. Not if you make me laugh. Not if you touch me like that. Mal. Suddenly his head jerked up and he put a finger to his lips. Hands above your heads. The voice came from the shadows of the trees. Mal dove for his rifle and had it at his shoulder in seconds, but three people were already emerging from the woods. Two men and a woman with her hair in a top knot. the muzzles of their weapons trained on us. I thought I'd recognize them from the convoy we'd seen on the road. Put that down, said a man with a short goatee, unless you want to see your girl plugged full of bullets. Mal set his rifle back on the rock. Come on over, said the man, nice and slow. He wore a first army coat, but he looked like no soldier I had ever seen. His hair was long and tangled, kept from his eyes by two messy plates. He wore belts of bullets across his chest and a stained waistcoat that might have once been red but was now fading to a color somewhere between plum and brown. I need my boots, said Mal. Less chance of you running without them. What do you want? You can start with answers, the man said. Town nearby, plenty more comfortable places to hole up. So what are a dozen people doing hiding out in the forest? He must have seen my reaction because he said, That's right, I found your camp. You deserters? Yes, said Mal smoothly. Out of Kursky. The man scratched his cheek. Kursky? Maybe, he said. But he took a step forward. Oretsev? Mal stiffened, then said, Luchenko? All saints, I haven't seen you since your unit trained with me in Politsnaya. He turned to the other men. This little pissant was the best tracker in ten regiments. Never seen anything like it. He was grinning, but he didn't lower his rifle. And now you're the most famous deserter in all of Ravka. Just trying to survive. You and me both, brother, he gestured to me. This isn't your usual. If I hadn't had a rifle in my face, the comment might have stung. One more First Army grunt like us. Like us, huh? Luchinko jabbed at me with his gun. Take off the scarf. Bit of a chill in the air, I said. Luchinko gave me another poke. Go on, girl. I glanced at Mal. I could see him weighing the options. We were at close range. I could do some serious damage with the cut, but not before the militiamen got off a few rounds. I could blind them, but if we started a firefight, what might happen to the people back at camp? I shrugged and pulled the scarf from my neck with a rough tug. Luchenko gave a low whistle. Heard you were keeping hallowed company, Aretsev. Looks like we caught ourselves a saint. He cocked his head to one side. Thought she'd be taller. Find them both. Again, I locked gazes with Mal. He wanted me to act. I could feel it. As long as my hands weren't bound together, I could summon and control the light. But what about the other Grisha? I held up my hands and let the woman secure my wrists with rope. Mal sighed and did the same. Can I at least put my shirt on, he asked. No, she said with a leer. I like the view. Luchenko laughed. Life's a funny thing, isn't it, he said philosophically as they marched us into the woods at gunpoint. All I ever wanted was a drop of luck to flavor my tea. Now I'm drowning in it. The Darkling will empty his coffers to have the two of you delivered to his door. You're going to hand me over that easily, I said. Foolish. Big talk from a girl with a rifle at her back. It's just good business, I said. You think Fierda or the Shuhan won't pay a small fortune, maybe even a large fortune, to get their hands on the Sun Summoner? How many men do you have? Luchenko glanced over his shoulder and wagged his finger at me like a schoolteacher. Well, it had been worth a try. All I meant, I continued innocently, was that you could auction me off to the highest bidder and keep all your men fat and happy for the rest of their days. I like the way she thinks, said the woman with the top knot. Don't get greedy, Ekaterina, Luchenko said. We aren't ambassadors or diplomats. The bounty on that girl's head will buy us all passage through the border. Maybe I'll catch a ship out of Dierholm. Or maybe I'll just bury myself in blondes for the rest of my days. The unsavory image of Luchenko cavorting with a bunch of curvy Fjordans was driven from my mind as we entered the clearing. The Grisha had been rounded up at its center and were surrounded by a circle of nearly thirty armed militiamen. Toya was bleeding heavily from what looked like a bad blow to the head. Harsha had been on watch, and one glance at him told me he'd been shot. He was pale, swaying on his feet, clutching the wound at his side and panting as Oncat yowled. See, said Lachenko, with this windfall, I don't need to worry about the highest bidder. I stepped in front of him, keeping my voice as low as I could. Let them go, I said. 
If you turn them over to the Darkling, they'll be tortured. And I swallowed the bolt of rage that coursed through me. Threats would get me nowhere. A living prisoner is more valuable than a corpse, I said meekly. At least untie me so I can see to my friend's injury. And so I can mow down your militia with a flick of my wrist. Ekaterina narrowed her eyes. Don't do it, she said. Have one of her bloodletters take care of him. She gave me a jab in the back and steered us into the group with the others. Spy that collar, Luchinko asked of the crowd. We have the Sun Summoner. There were exclamations and a few whoops from the rest of the militia. So start thinking about how you're going to spend all of the Darkling's money. They cheered. Why not ransom her to Nikolai Lansoff, said a soldier from somewhere near the back of the circle. Now that I was in the middle of the clearing, there seemed to be even more of them. Lansoff, Luchinko said. If he has a brain in his head, he's rusticating somewhere warm with a pretty girl on his knee. If he's even alive. He's alive, said someone. Luchinko spat. Makes no matter to me. And your country, I asked. What has my country ever done for me, little girl? No land, no life, just a uniform and a gun. Doesn't matter if it's the Darkling on the throne or some useless Lansov. I saw the prince when I was in Azalta, said Ekaterina. He's not bad looking. Not bad looking, said another voice. He's damnably handsome. Luchenko scowled. Since when? Brave in battle, smart as a whip. Now the voice seemed to be coming from above us. Luchenko craned his neck, peering into the trees. An excellent dancer, said the voice. Oh, and an even better shot. Who? Luchenko never got to finish. A blast rang out and a tiny black hole appeared between his eyes. I gasped. Impos. Don't say it, muttered Mal. Then chaos erupted.